Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So, no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So, welcome to church. Good morning and welcome to Sunday School again. Uh, my name is Ricky Pitts and I'll be your Sunday School teacher for today. And I'm teaching on behalf of Bishop Nolan T. Torbert and True Deliverance Holiness Church. And we're gonna talk about a, another subject today that is one that we all have to use. And we've all used uh, at some point uh, form in our life, at some point in our lives, whether we knew it or not, but it is a necessary part of, of everything that we do. We're talking about faith. And the, the subject is a necessary faith. And it's coming from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 8. And then it goes down to verse 13 through 16. It's a lot of material, so I'm going to have to jump right in and, and, uh, to get started. But I want to say this real quick. The Sunday School books have been ordered. We had a lot of, of, uh, of you to order books this time, so we appreciate it. Thank you very much. And those that didn't get a chance to order books, if you missed uh, the order, you can still go to christianbooks.com and order your book yourself individually. It's going to cost you just a little bit more as an individual book, but um, you know you can uh, certainly get it. You have it in in, a, in enough time before the next season starts, which is right around the corner. So let's get started. The lesson aims is to state the definition of faith and to explain the meaning, number two, and significance of the key verse, which is Hebrews 11 and 1. The third thing, the third aim is to list one change each in the categories of thought, behavior, and speech by which he or she will become more of a stranger to the world. Then the lesson has uh, an outline. There are three sections in the outline. One is the meaning of faith, which is Hebrews 11, one through three. Number two is the examples of faith. And number three is the goal of faith. So let's just kind of jump right in and look at the meaning of faith because the word makes it real, real plain. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtain a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now, this first part of our lesson is a pretty is a pretty profound part of the entire lesson. This verse number one is. And so let's just kind of jump right in. Uh, and I can, according to our commentary, and bring out a few things. We can't cover it all because we would not get it done in not, not 30 minutes, not even an hour. But the phrase things hoped for reminds us of the way in which faith and the way in which hope are linked together throughout the entire New Testament. You read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, and also Galatians chapter 5 and verse 5. Things hoped for calls to mind something I want you to do some homework on and look up. It is the platonic philosophical distinction. That's what the, that's what the commentary calls it. 
you've heard the word platonic. People say oh, they're in a platonic relationship, or you know, we're just friends. And you know, you know what the word, I look up the word platonic, and also the word philosophical, and also the distinction between the material, the things that we can touch, feel, and and see, and the spiritual things we can't see, can't touch. But we also learned that in reality, the things that are unseen are perfected. And the things that are unseen are more real than the things that we can see, than the physical ob objects. We also learned that the physical objects that we can see, the thing we can touch, are only shadows of the real things, which is the spiritual things. Now, that's pretty, that's pretty profound. And the spiritual realm, we learn, is real. The spiritual realm, we learn, has real consequences in the life that we live right now. And also the spiritual realm offers greater hope than what we can experience in our physical lives. So let me just kind of, kind of sum that up. The things that we see are only a shadow of the things that we can't see. The things that we see are only a shadow of the spiritual things that are more real than the things that we can put our hands on, touch, smace, taste, smell, and see. The spiritual is more real than, than the, the material. So then there is, then there's that word we see in the, in the text, substance, which is best understood as something like the foundation for trust or the foundation for conviction. I mean, what do you really and truly believe? The substance is like, well, it's like a, we learned in the commentary, it's like a down payment. And that down payment gives us the conviction that the full thing, the full amount, the full uh, material or whatever it may be we're trying to grasp is on the way. So then the, the substance is a down payment. Then there's that word evidence. The word evidence is best understood as proof or best understood as the demonstration. So this faith journey, this word faith, is a pretty profound word. Then we also learn that obtain, we see in the second verse, obtain a good report. And we, we see that that translate a Greek verb that means to witness or it means to testify. It's like in 1 John chapter 4, verses 14, and we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. In other words, the faith of the elders has been witnessed and not tested, but attested, verified, justified, proven, has been attested. And the one that did the attesting was God. And he's the one who gave, and, and, and this is the one you want to always to give, a good report. God gave a good report as he witnessed, as he, as he saw the faithfulness of our spiritual ancestors. And that's a pretty powerful thing to know. So he validated their faith in the realities that they could not see. Let me say that again. The Lord validated uh, their faith, he confirmed their faith, he authenticated their faith in realities th of the th that they could not see, but yet they still had to believe, and they still did believe. So then we see in verse three that it is it is faith then that shows us the reality of the divine creation by the spoken word of God. So what we see then comes from what we do not see. Let me say that again. What we see with these physical eyes comes from what we do not see with these physical eyes. So there's a spiritual then reality that's unseen by these physical eyes. You may say, what do you mean? See, the word spiritual reality simply means that the spirit, the spirit world is real. There are things that, that if we saw certain things, it'll probably scare us to where we're running high because we, we, we can't imagine the things that we see that's up above our head. 
and, and also the things that we wrestle against, spiritual wickedness in high places, things that we simply cannot see. And if, we, if the Lord opened our eyes and let us see what's really going on, oh my goodness. But one thing we know, we have evidence. And we have the evidence and we can believe in the evidence. The evidence is in the word of God. And we know that they are there. Can't see them, but we know that they're there. We can't see the angels that, 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 that rides with us. We can't see the angels that has protected us and saved us many times. And we'll, we'll, we'll come to know that when we get to glory, but they're there. Now, we, now we're gonna cross over to examples of faith in uh, the fourth, fifth, and sixth verse of chapter 11. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it, he being dead, yet speaking. Oh, my goodness. Verse, verse five, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this, this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So now we see Abel is, is the first of 18 biblical figures cited in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. And some ancient commentaries noted that in Genesis 4 and 5, uh, it seemed to make a a distinction between the person or that person and the offering of that person. And it also seemed to suggest that Cain had a bad attitude in his giving. And sometimes people wonder, they wonder why they're not getting their result and yet they're still giving. You, you may want to check your attitude in, in your giving. Whatever the case may be, God testified of Abel's gifts. He testified and he validated Abel's gift. And, and not only that, it confirmed Abel's righteousness because Abel gave his gift with the proper attitude, the right mindset, with, with, a, with a, a mindset of giving a perfect offering, giving it for the right reason, for the right way, not to be seen, not to be heard, so to speak but for the right reason and for the right way. And then listen to this, by his faith, the Bible says being, he being dead, yet speaketh. You read in Genesis chapter four, verse 10, the voice of thy brother's blood cried unto me from the ground. Now, let me just kind of say this again, the spiritual is real. And so there's a sense then that the, the writer of Hebrew understood able to still be alive in some sense, in some sense. So Abel's sacrifice then demonstrates as a continuing witness, what? That the just shall live by faith. You've heard folks say that, you know, so-and-so is gone, but their spirit is still here. Y'all you, you, have heard that. You know, so, they, they walk in a room and they can almost sense that they are, that they're still there, but they've been dead now for a lot of years. And I ain't gonna get into that today, okay? And 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 how all that unwinds. But I, but we we read that Abel Abel was dead, but yet still spoke. His blood cried from the ground, and so the writer had some sense that this guy is still somehow alive. You hear folks said when a child is is real small, say that boy been here before. A little, little, little bit, a little bit of child, three years old, say something that's so profound. He said, mm, that boy, that been here before. No, it ain't that he'd been here before. He was already there before. Did y'all hear what I said? He existed before he came here. Y'all, y'all don't want to deal with that this morning. So, but let me, so let me move on. So the book of Genesis then denotes only going to another figure, a few words about this man called Enoch. But it was enough to, 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 to give the great significance of what was said in those few words, the word translated. 
has a sense of being taken away. And in Genesis 5, 22 to 24, here's what it says. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. But the word don't say why God took him. Not right here, not in this text right here in Genesis. But Hebrew gives us, the book of Hebrews gives us somewhat of a, a peak, a glimmer as to the reason God took him. Well, he pleased God. So Enoch then didn't go by the way of the grave. God just took him up. He pleased God. And God took him. My goodness. Took him to a better place. Took him to a land. Took him to a home. Took him to a city that wasn't made by the hands of man. The fact that Enoch pleased God has brought the writer to, uh, to what the, the commentary calls a general principle. What's the general principle? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We also learned that faith involves two then approaches. He that cometh to God. Number one, the one who comes to God must believe that God exists. Okay, that just makes sense, doesn't it? If you're going to come to him and talk to him and walk with him and believe in him and ask something of him, ask him to heal you, ask him to, to give you this and give you that, you got to believe that God exists. So number two, and that God rewards those who seek him. The question is, how much do we seek him? You see, I, I was thinking about this as in, pre in preparation. I said, my goodness, how much do I really seek the Lord? and go after him and see all the things that he has, that he is. And he, God is so profound. God is so deep, so big, so wide, so huge. So it's hard to imagine how big God is. How much do we seek God? And belief in God then has to go further than just acknowledging that he exists. Got to go a little deeper than that. We must believe that he is, number one, he's ready. We got to also believe that he, he's willing, and we got to believe that he's able to reward those that seek him. We must believe in the power of God. We must believe in the goodness of God because he got all power. And boy, he's, look at this. He's getting gooder. He gets gooder and gooder. I know y'all don't, ain't never heard of gooder. He gets gooder and gooder as the day go by, as the years go by. As we get to know him better, we, when, then we reminisce on what he's done for us. We, we reminisce on where he has brought us from. Old folks say he brought me from a mighty, you know, they said, from, from a mighty long ways. Let's go over to verses, uh, examples of faith. In verse 7 and 8, by faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he, con he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went. So then we see that Noah's trust in God regarding the things that he could not see is the real core, the real essence of faith. And we see the word fear. Fear is not that he was, oh, he going to kill me. No, no. This kind of fear was the healthy fear. It was a fear of a reverence and a respect for God. But it was faith that drove him, that drove Noah to start building that ark. It was faith that gave him the ability to, to, to zone out of what people had to say about him. How they was talking about him. That man is crazy. I have building an ark and ain't, ain't, ain't a drop of rain out here. And he did that for many, many years. The faith allowed him to take action in the face of radicule. You so sometimes we can't do nothing because y'all know why we can't do it. We worried about what people gonna say and what they gonna do. These folks down here talking about me, 
and we paralyze. In, in 2, Peter, 2 Peter 2 and 5, uh, re referred to Noah as a preacher of righteousness. Now, y'all know that Noah done did some stuff. Now, y'all, I ain't going to get into all that today, but the, the word calls him a preacher of righteousness. And so then Noah's actions in building the ark was the tangible manifestation of his faith. When people saw him taking action, they say, you know what, that guy show sure enough believes in what he's doing. Because I can look, look at he out here every day with a hammer and some wood and sewing and all this him. So this man believe it's a tangible. I can see your faith by what you do. And sometimes what we do talk so loud, folk can't believe nothing that was said. So, so, so what he was doing was a tangible manifestation that this guy believed in what he said. And those who saw him was exposed to this, to, to this faith message. And his decision, he made a decision to act in faith, was a condemnation of the darkness all around him. Because he told them, y'all don't straighten up and fly right. It's going gonna, it's gonna to rain. Y'all know that's something. It's going to rain. You better get ready and you better bad in mind. It's going to rain. God Almighty, ain't that a rainbow sign? That it won't be water. It's going to be fine next time. The truth of the gospel lived out through our faith and love, the truth of the gospel, that we walk and talk and live and walk is, is a testimony against sin, that we got to live right. And we're going to get to something in a minute that uh, I want y'all to, well, let's get to it now. I want uh, hell, fire, and brimstone. You don't hear that too much now. And I want to read this part in the commentary and give you a clear uh, illustration that within the lifetime of most of us, a shift has taken place in preaching without denying the doctrine of eternal punishment. Preachers have found that the Christian message gains a more favorable hearing by presenting a positive message. But the, rea but the reality is that just as there is a heaven to gain, there is a hell to avoid. And these are two sides of the same coin. The question is, as we witness the friends, as we witness the neighbors, how do we communicate the realities effectively of both of these two doors here? One that leads to heaven and one that leads to a place called hell. It's real, uh, class. Don't let nobody fool you. It's sure enough, it's real. So we see then that Abraham acted on his faith in that eighth verse. When he was called to go to a place, a higher place, and it was an unknown assignment, he acted on faith. And so many people right now in the world, in the Christian dome, they are held back from achieving the great things of God. You know why? Because they are fearing the unknown. I ain't going over there. I ain't going down there. I don't know what's down yonder. You know, but if God called them to go down yonder, to go over there, if God calls them, don't worry because he's already made a way. So when God calls us for a task, there's, a, there's an additional calling. There's a, there's a calling that we got to trust in him. There's a calling that we got to follow his direction. And in, in our lifetime, in our lifetime, we're going to be called on to do things that we could not have anticipated. We're going to be called on to do things that, that's beyond our wildest imaginations. But if God calls us, you can rest assured that he's already made a way. And the question then is, are we ready to trust God? Even when we don't have all the necessary equipment, we don't have the necessary resources to get the job done, to go on that journey. And we can't even, we can't even fathom getting it done. We can't imagine crossing the finish line. Can we trust God? And do we have faith as all these folks in the, and the word of God has, I don't know if we're going to get through with this today because this lesson here, do, do we have the faith to do what all these, these men in the, in, the, in the movement did? So let's cross over now and look at the goal of faith. These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them 
and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For, for, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they had come out, from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he had prepared for them a city. Now, the word says they all died in the faith. What does that mean? That means that they all hung in there. They all was faithful until the very end. And these faithful people died, never really receiving the fruit of their labor. In other words, they never received the verification of their faith. It was never really clarified. They didn't really see the proof of their faith, but they died believing. And that's hard to imagine in this microwave world that we live in, in this world where people expect instant gratification. I want to get it. I want, to, I want it now. And it's hard to imagine how these guys could really hold on and hang on and never, have the, never even had their faith verified. But they also realized that they, they, they were strangers and pilgrims. And they were strangers and pilgrims that wandered, but they had a goal. They weren't just wandering without a goal. They had heaven on their mind. They had a journey to go home. They had heaven on their mind. They had a, they had a place that was not made by the hands of man. They had heaven on their mind. And it was going to a place to see God, to see him face to face. To, to, to experience the glory of God. They, they had heaven on their mind and they believed it so strong that even though they died, never having seen or verified when they got there, boy, don't you know they were satisfied when they got over there. So then homesickness, homesickness for their old country would have become an obstacle to their focus on, on a better land, that word better, going to a better land. And then given the problems that they had, given the risk that they faced, it would have been easy for them to go back and go back to the comforts of home. I ain't gonna have, I ain't gonna deal with this, all this over here. I'm sick and tired of all this over here. I'm going back to the house. But they didn't look at the, the old country. They had their eyes on heaven. And in the first century AD, the Jewish Christians what was what, standing on the cliff, about ready to jump, on the edge of walking away from this newfound faith because it was dealing with so much. And they, and they remembered their upbringing. They remembered Judaism. In the old country, they, got, they had a promise to get some relief from this social and economic injustice and pressure. They were promised uh, when they made their decision to make Jesus their choice, to follow Christ. We ain't gonna go through this stuff much, much longer. But how many of y'all know that when you got saved, your problems did not go away? And, and sometimes your problems even got better. I mean, got, got not worse before they got better. But you, 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 you been born again, you learn how to deal with them a little bit better. Ain't that something? They didn't go away, but boy, you sure enough learn how to deal with them. We got to bring this thing to a close now. Okay? And as, as the old preacher said, I got to, clo I got to close now. And so, and so, 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 so then that, that word better, the word better is all throughout the book of Hebrews. Even though these generals, these, these heroes and giants of faith never did get a chance to see better, they, 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 they really acknowledged that where they was going was supreme, was superior, and they acknowledged that by the things that they did, by their action, they knew we're going to a better place. We're going to a place where we ain't got to worry about all this stuff down here no more. We're going to a better place. And all this was a model for the audience of Hebrews. All this was a, an example. And if they oriented their desires toward heaven, and if heaven was their view, they was going to find and they was going to see one day the true and living God. And that true and living God wasn't going to be ashamed to say, y'all, y'all can call me your God. I mean, I'm, I'm y'all's God. Come on over here. Come on up higher. I got a place for you. I have a city for you. I got a permanent resting place for you. So hold on, good soldier. 
Come, come on up. You fought a good fight. You finished your course. You finished the race. Come up higher. And that, that's going to be something that we, all of us got to look forward to. But we got to go through this wilderness down here. Okay, but, but keep in mind, we just, we're only pilgrims and strangers passing through this old borrowed land. This, this is a necessary, listen, listen y'all don't want to miss next week. Next week, whew, next week is going to be persevere. It's going to be a patient, preserving faith. We're talking about persevering, using faith to persevere. Coming from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 36. Y'all listen, listen. Read your lesson and show enough. Tune in for Sunday for the class next week. Have your ink pen, do some highlighting, take some notes because this word next week. Oh my goodness! Hey, look, y'all have a good rest of the day. We'll see you. The Lord say the same in, in Sunday in church today, and uh, I'm getting ready for that word that Bishop Nolan T. Torbers getting ready to deliver with power and authority. Y'all take care, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>